Welcome to the Weekly Trend, a podcast for navigating the markets through the lens of technical analysis. The Weekly Trend podcast is provided for educational purposes only and does not constitute any professional advice. Listeners should not act upon the information or content without first seeking advice from a registered financial planner. Welcome back to the Weekly Trend podcast. Today is Friday, September 6, 2024. S&P 500 currently sitting at 5416. I'm David Zarling. I'm here with Ian McMillan. And I'm wondering, Ian, if we are going to combine together for a no-hitter today. Is that possible? Well, uh, it looks like stocks are combining for a no-hitter on the week. Close. Everything is down except for, I think, utilities and staples on the week. If we held price right here on S and P 500, this would be our third, I believe, our third minus two percent day on the year. Wow! On average, we typically see about five or six in an uptrending market. Obviously, those tend to be larger in downtrending markets or a higher quantity, and that's from Ryan Dietrich, who does great research. And so here we have a a price reaction. You know, we saw the S&P 500 get all the way back up to 5660 and we found sellers again at that level. And so now the thesis of a sideways range being built continues to be confirmed after a great run from late October last year until mid-July and something like the S&P 500. Obviously, we had the July pullback, but since we claimed that level and now we're pulling back again, this is where we find out if there's buyers, right? The market is about supply and demand. We're going to go see if we can find demand in the market. And if we can't, we'll know. That's why we use charts. No demand this week. No. That, yeah, tech. By far the worst sector, down almost 6%. Now, I mean, this is midday on Friday, four-day week. Obviously, we're off on Monday, but... I mean, yeah, you can talk about tech, but Russell's right there with the NASDAQ on the week, down on, you know, both down about four and a half percent. S&P's down about three. Dow's down about two. But yeah, not a lot of, not a lot of spared stocks this week in the damage. To your point, got basically back up to those previous all time highs, filled a gap from, was that July 17th? Basically yep. filled that gap down from the 16th into the 17th and quickly selling back off again. Still above 5,400. And still above a rising 200 day. Still above 4,800. Do we get another trip? I mean, yeah, it's. The move from like late October, day. it's always important to remember that the move from late October into July is in the top quintile, if not in the top percentile of nine month moves. It's a good one. It's a very strong one. Very strong move to digest that move would be perfectly healthy to increase the activity between buyers and sellers to determine where price truly should be is an important process of price discovery. I mean, that's what this is. This is called the auction process and people shouldn't really get mad at it. I mean, I'm not saying that people shouldn't like just love that there's 7% volatility happening or a 10% range that happens. But that would be perfectly normal considering it's September and October, September being notoriously weak and October being a what I would call a volatility amplifier directionally. And so we're heading into two months here that seasonally speaking have been weak and especially the second half of September tends to be weak. Now, you don't use it as a guarantee or a predictor, you use it on, do we get that? Do we get a really weak second part of September? I don't know. I, do you know? I don't. Dang it. The, uh, I thought things, you would know. No. Yeah. I mean, you just you definitely got a clear mm. line in the sand of 5,600 or 56, 50, 50, you know, whatever you want to call it. And, you know, we'll see what we do if we come down to this 200 day or what day did we bottom? I guess it was August 5th. That was all the Japan stuff that Monday. So, yeah, to use like we get it. You get a nine, 10 percent range in here. To me, it 
because we're market historians, it's really interesting to see, you know, there was a period of August, September, a little bit of October 2020 that was like this. You had had a huge move out of the COVID low, and then you had this really spike in volatility in that August, September range that also sure. created a decent side range that was really quick. And do we get that same thing? Because right when some really smart technicians that, that we know, like a JC Pretz or Steve Straza, they highlighted that when the VIX spikes like it did back in July, first part of August, that's when correlations go to one. Yeah. And when the VIX cools off, that's when correlations cool off. And I think that's a great way to describe what we're currently seeing. There's some sectors doing better than others. There's some stocks doing better than others. Another fancy word would be bifurcation. You know, you're not, you're seeing a, a separation of those things that continue to move higher and those things that are not. And the beauty of using the visualization of price is you've highlighted 5,600. We have a rising 200 day at 5,100. We have a volume pocket, if I can call it that, where it would make sense to see buyers and sellers interact near, you know, between 5,300 and 5,400 to fill in the volume there. Because just the July move alone pulled up the entire auction process that took place from late October through now. We had had going into that July high, the volume point of control was 4560 on the S&P 500. And just this action that we've seen through now has pulled that up to 5240. So we now have this range developing that we're going to find out where the buyers are. We're going to find out if the buyers are for real, or is this all distribution? And I know you and Kevin talked last week, you know, areas of risk off or price levels that are important. We'll see if any of those are, are triggered. Yeah, definitely but, some things out there that are, let's say, not what you would see in a fully throttling risk on environment. I don't really know if, if we're in the left hand lane doing 85 right now. You know, what we said earlier, you're, ta- you're only two positive sectors for the week where utilities and staples. We mentioned some relationships some risk on relationships like junk bonds versus the broad bond market. Again, it's it's a relationship that really got hit hard going into August 5th. I would say really hasn't fixed itself. And then I would put high beta versus low vol. Really, to me, they're almost identical charts. These relationships are in an uptrend. So, you know, like anything important to keep that context But intermediate term, short intermediate term, definitely you had to have every box checked. You'd never participate in anything in the market. Right. Um, But it's tough. I mean, I think you got to realize like if tech's going to underperform, that will be some type of headwind. It just mathematically is going to be a headwind. Right. Now, to what degree that headwind happens and, you know, other things participate in, uh, but we haven't seen that. It's it's not like tech had a bad week and seven of the 11 sectors were up. Right. And so you kind of got this glimpse of like, okay, well, maybe it's not really that bad under the surface. Yeah, definitely some. But Ian, you know, how, can, how can NVIDIA just smash earnings? And be lower. Yeah, NVIDIA's. That was a market leader. And I think it's worth paying attention to that. It's kind of similar to when you see just terrible earnings. Yeah. You see a gap, you know, you see a gap down or you see some type of response that's opposite of what you would think. You need to pay attention to that. And so if you have NVIDIA, a market leader off of the October 22 bottom, like one of the most prevalent ones, and it has record setting earnings. And the institutions decide to sell at this point, it is worth paying attention to. I'm not saying it's like straight down from here by any means. But yeah, clearly things have changed. I definitely think it is. I mean, I think most people are sitting a little bit more upright in their chairs these days. 
regarding the market. And if NVIDIA closed right here, right now, on a relative basis, it would be at a new versus S&P. It would record a new lower low on a very near term basis, which just is just kind of signaling that there's a pause that auctioning needs to happen here. Now we're going to find out if this auctioning is distribution or whether buyers are willing to step up and pay a higher price. It's really that simple. We don't really need to overcomplicate it. No. Everybody loves an uptrend. Yeah. I don't know how long it lasts. I don't wish trends went in straight lines. SMH, semiconductors are below a 200-day moving average. On a relative basis, they've broken a horizontal level that's important versus the S&P. Gold miners fell off. Yeah. I mean, not drastically, but that was, and there was not a lot of areas making new relative highs lately, given all the back and forth and wishy-washiness we've had. Gold miners were there, not last. Dollar, it's not like the dollar's been ripping higher. We found support at 101, which, you know, I'm pretty sure Dave and I talked about two weeks ago to expect. Uh, It's a pretty big area where we've been finding support for really 18 months at this point. So we did find support there. Dollar bounced. (coughs) You know, and here's the other thing. So, right, weak dollar is supposed to be, I mean, I would say we're still on a weak, like a weak dollar. Yeah, we're below it. Down this week. I'm pretty sure the dollar is down this week. We're now below a falling 200 day moving average in in a trade weighted dollar using DXY. Yeah, no. so why hasn't this showed up? Or I saw a comment today, you know, rate like rates have really we talked about this in the client letter that's going out today, but rates really I mean you got I mean longer like duration is I mean year to date lows for a thirty year treasury yield, basically yeah, where we were on Christmas. Yep. And Christmas of last year, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's yeah, you're definitely seeing some signs in the bond complex using but I thought, something like I thought lower rates were supposed I mean, that's supposed to be a huge reprieve for especially the small caps. And you know what's interesting is Mike Zaccardi, a CMT, posted some information yesterday about the average returns when I saw that between three and four. Yes. So yep. stock stocks have done the worst when the ten year was between three and four percent. We're currently sitting north of three point seven. And so it's it's it is interesting to keep that in mind that quote unquote lower rates don't necessarily equate better stock performance. Or some Goldilocks scenario. Right. One thing I want to kind of run past you here is you know the topic du jour is the uninversion. So is that yes. version? Oh my gosh. So the uninversion of the yield curve, 210, two-year yields, 10-year yields, there seems to be a lot of focus in the industry there because the high prevalence of quote-unquote recessions when this takes place, but it's typically months out, it, you know, like 12 to 18 months out from that, which if we're recording that, my thoughts go towards this is people looking at data since 1990. Yeah, exactly. Now- This has been a lot like- it even goes back to, I mean, really anything when the data was like, oh, this happened in a rising rate env- or a falling rate environment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what I wanted to get your opinion on is we talk about this uninversion of the yield curve. And we really are talking about the data going back to 1990, which was or is in a falling rate environment. And then those same analysts will discount when we were shifting from a rising rate to a falling rate in the early 80s, that the uninversion meant nothing. So you have seen data pre-1980. Right. And and, and, the, and the uninversion didn't mean anything. Right. It didn't forecast a recession. Sometimes it did. Sometimes it didn't. It, it was a blurry signal. And so we're very, as an industry as a whole, very myopic to the falling rate environment information. And so it does make us wonder if we're in a new rising rate environment and that because I understand we started this part of the conversation talking about rates falling for this year. That's a very near term perspective. 
Yeah. In the grand scheme of things, we saw bonds further than stocks during the corrective period of 22 and 23. And is this some type of pullback in bonds in an ongoing downtrend? That's to be determined. Yeah, I, guess my simple- that's, I mean, that's where really my, again, to be determined, I think that's the scenario I continue to err on. Well, and what we know, like... Government can do whatever they want. We can go back to ZERP tomorrow and... That's off the table, but we've really pushed this 34 year cycle, 30 to 40 year cycle. Like, I just don't know. I mean, it's like, and what can a government do against massive global interest rate cycles? Right. Some believe the Fed sets the rate. We make the argument that the market sets the rate and the Fed is forced to follow. Yeah. I mean, they talk about, oh, we're getting rate cuts. Well, I can look at treasuries and tell you the market's telling you that. I don't need yeah, the mar- Yeah, I don't need Jerry telling me that in September when the bond market's already telling me that now. I mean, the bond market's already telling us that rates on the near term are going lower. And yeah. that doesn't have to be a great thing for equities. Because I've even heard the comment of, oh, isn't that convenient that they're going to cut rates right before the election? Well, I think they're just responding to the market. There's also the theory that, I mean, the first rate cut after a hiking cycle usually brings some type of market weakness. Right. I mean, I've seen that data. And again, it's I don't think it's 100%, but, and I'm not saying you get a recession, but you do get, I'm not trying to put on like a macro hat, but it's kind of one of those, when they cut rates after raising them and raising them, it's kind of this like, oops, we went too far. And so the market can sometimes see that market participants can see that as a, how many times have we talked about people, institutional decision makers out there, the trillions of dollars that get thrown around, how many of them were making decisions, even if they were around 40 years ago, probably pretty young in their careers, were they even making decisions? It's just, it's a really, a really, a really, a brand new landscape, potentially a brand new landscape regarding in interest rates. For the that next is 40 years. Yeah, 40 years. And I, I, I mentioned in the client letter, no one wants to hear after all of the hoopla over six to seven percent mortgages oh my gosh can you imagine reading well rates could continue up for the next three decades and again they won't move in a straight line are we going back to 14 percent mortgages i don't know i don't know if it means we go back to the extremes of the 70s I don't know necessarily what it means for the stock. I mean, the stock market is pretty sideways there from like 68 to 82. Correct. And if you had a trend following, we do actually have the data. If you were like a, even like as much as people and it died, like historically it's bad, but like I think the 50 or 200 day was actually pretty good. Like you did really well in the 70s with trend following, even with kind of a, a late signal, like a 50 to 200 day. But it was just a mess. Yeah, I don't know what it means, but I yeah, I'm still in the camp that I don't know, maybe hey, hey, lock that mortgage in at 7%. I don't know if it's going to be at 7% in 5 years, right. 10 years. Yeah, the near term is maybe, possible. Yeah. The near term is possible, but it, it goes back to the topic du jour on uninversion is based on a 1990s through now mindset. But we know that markets have multiple cycles, okay? We could talk about the 10-year oil cycle. We could talk about the 18-and-a-half-year real estate cycle. We could talk about the 40-year interest rate cycle. And these are things that go back to the 1700s, 1600s. There are forces at work that exceed our ability to comprehend on a timeline. And are you open-minded enough when you manage risk that the information is more like a pre-1990s. So does an uninversion not carry the same weight in a rising rate environment? That's, again, to be determined. We don't know, but we're open-minded enough. 
And the beauty is we don't have to guess. I mean, S&P 500, step one below below the prior high is information. Below a 200-day moving average is information. 4,800 is information. I've got one for you, too, on to go back to your cycles. I don't think you mentioned this one. And it's not one we bring up a ton. But I know I, we don't need to get into it here. But the GAN cycle... 2024 is an interesting, and I mean, right? We got the 2020 panic. Now, 2022, you know, again, this is not, I wouldn't say like this is going to line up always like January through the end of December. It's, there's some it's give and take. It's a window. Yeah, it's a window. But you're 24, 25, really 26. And the last, so, and I'm not saying it happens. The last signal for this was 2006. We know the worst of the worst did not come in 2006. But I mean, the last one was thereafter. Yeah, the GAN cycle said 06, 08, the market's going to get crushed. There were things that started selling off in 06 and 07. That's right. uh, For sure. For sure thing. I mean, markets started to top out and got real weird well before, you know, 2008. Right. So do we, I don't know. It's another thing. I'm just saying, I'm just saying it lines up. This is a cycle that goes back to, to go to your point earlier, a cycle that goes back to 1784. You can read it for yourself. I do find that the 2024 2025 window is and that kind of fits on that 18 year i think doesn't he kind of work off an 18 year yeah there's there's an 18 year cycle there as well yeah because your next one's 2042 2043 we are entering a window and ian's not bringing this up to sound more bearish than we need to be it's just awareness that there's a panic cycle that has windows does it come to fruition? No idea, but it's why we use technical analysis. Like we don't have to guess at this. We will know if sellers have control if we can't hold something like an S and P five hundred, step one fifty two fifty, step two, the low that we recorded in August fifty one forty, the two hundred day moving average, which is near fifty one forty. If you we start moving through those levels or you create a sideways range that right because because consolidations quote unquote should resolve in the direction of the prior trend so we have an uptrend if we're having a consolidation which that thesis seems to be confirmed if we have a consolidation and it breaks to the downside yeah that would yeah i mean if you're going against historical norms there and I know that, you know, I know people sit here and they're like, oh, a, t- a trend should continue in the direction, it, you know, right. Like, duh, Ian. Duh, Dave. That's so simple. I don't, can't use that to beat a market. I mean, that's. Yeah, people people don't like simple. I mean, I think it can, I mean, but you, you know, you got to appreciate the trends. But yeah, if we get out of here, short term, we lost kind of this, whatever you want to call it up here, 55, 90. But yeah, I mean, you break below the August 5th lows at 50, well, let's call it 5,100. That's going to put you below a 200-day too. Right. And yeah, then you really start. Now, our last trip below the 200-day lasted for a week, that last week of October. Correct. And before that, that one lasted a week too. That was March 2023. So we'll see, but yeah, we are getting up there, getting there. Well, there's and, some things, there are there are things lining up that say, expect some weakness. To what degree, we'll see, but. Yeah, this two-month this two period, historically volatile, the market update to clients highlights that. The relationship of technology to the S&P 500 Right, because you're always you're always analyzing where should we be positioned and where shouldn't we be positioned. Because where you're not positioned is just as important. But 
XLK versus SLP using technology has been a leader for a while. Yeah. Is responding to a price level that was important going back 24 years, going back to March of 2000. And we've since responded to that level in XLK versus S&P back in July. Yeah. And we've lost a 200-day moving average, and we're going to record another lower low in the very near term. And so there's really no advantage in tech at this point. It could have absolutely rebound. I mean, you could have a flat 200-day moving average that goes on till next year, summer of next year. But I'll tell you, when I pull up a chart like this, Dave, when I pull up a multi-decade chart of this relationship and look at it, I mean, there is significant potential. Like, And we're talking about, this is honestly maybe even, well, you know, best case scenario, if you're a growth or tech, you know, lover that rips higher, sure. Your most healthy and practical situation, again, this is in the context of 25 years, is that this relationship goes sideways for, I don't know, five, seven, 10 years? Right. That's what you got to like, you got to think about it in that context. There may be no advantage to owning tech and growth for a decade. I'm just throwing it out there. Right. Now, here and there, it'll work, you know, of course. It's going to have trends and counter trends, but it's something to consider. It's for sure something to consider. Well, and the the leader in tech was semiconductors, and you're now in a false breakout territory. Wow. When you look at SMH versus XLK. Or even look at SOX, so the the actual SOX, not the ETF, but the Philadelphia Semiconductor yep. versus SPX. That's a failed breakout. Yeah. You have to pay attention to that as being, are there no longer advantages, right? Just as NVIDIA has smashed earnings, launched this amazing chip called Blackwell, grandma's talking about it, the kids are talking about it. You could see you could see a scenario where there's really no advantage to being involved in semiconductors and tech because they're moving in a range versus the S&P 500. Their CEO of uh, what's Wang Jensen Wang. Yeah. I mean, he's hit borderline Hollywood celebrity status. Women yep. asking him to sign their bodies. Yep, on the um, cover of on the cover of Time magazine. Yeah, I mean, he's reached at least in the business world for sure, you know, this kind of celebrity can do no wrong status. Yep. It's worth paying attention to. Do we think this is a top? There's no way to know that. I, no I wish I did. Know. I wish I wish I I knew that. I mean, until you're below 4800, I don't know how you can say that. Correct. But and I know there's going to be people say, "Well, <laughs> 4,800 so far away. Well, yeah, it is. And that's how that's how big long-term trends look, work. It is just, you get below 4,800, and, uh, and I'll give you a two, a, below a 200-day and below, you know, we just talked about 51. I'd even say below the April lows at 49, you know, we'll call it 5,000. Yeah, I mean, it's, but 4,800... I don't know. We don't get to change our line in the sand, right? Not that big a one. And you brought up relationships before, right? High beta versus low vol is off. You know, it continues to move lower. Typically, we want to see that move higher. Your leaders, NVIDIA, there's definitely shots across the bow here. Eli Lilly, a leader, broke to new highs, has since pulled back with the RSI momentum divergence. Do we see these things cool off? You know, you have a economically sensitive item like crude oil that's going to record a price low that we haven't seen since March of 2023. Yes, brought we mentioned brought that up in the client letter. I think, Dave, I'm with you. I think the weakness we saw from mid July into early August, the subsequent rebound. I think. You know, as a technician that, yeah, we're trying to create, like, we're trying to create a range and figure out where this actual supply and demand is going to come in or if it comes in. I'm saying it has to. That's the beauty of this is 
Markets are a future discounting mechanism. I don't know why people forget, uh, and I'll always bring this up, that the market is looking out 12 to 18 months into the future. And the price movement that we're seeing now is about that. And it's also about finding who is willing to buy currently for the next 12 to 18 months. And so this, what appears now to be a range that sits, well, let's call it 5,100 on the low side, 5,660 on the high side, that type of price movement, we get to find out who's for real. Is it the sellers that are for real or is it the buyers that are for real? It is absolutely why we use technical analysis. There's no way about it. You can't make macro I bets. Sit here and guess. Right. Like the visualization of data is so powerful. It's one of the greatest inventions since candlesticks were invented that we can look on all these things on a chart, compare them to each other, you know, whether we're looking at technology versus the S&P or you're looking at semiconductors versus technology. Relative strength is real. Opportunity cost is real. You know, we talked about interest rates before, and here you have an aggregate bond, bond complex using AGG that's above important levels that have gone back to 2022. There's information upon us where we don't get to be surprised if we have a range. We don't get to be surprised. We break important levels to the downside, and we have that information. And at the same time, we have rising 200 days across a lot of different in instruments, and volatility is normal. You know, when you talk about candlesticks and the power, the power of simply zooming out on an historical price chart or something, I mean, there is a guy, I mean, there's just some dude in Japan in the 1700s. I shouldn't say some dude. I know his name, Hamamuni, Munihisa. Yeah. And he just decided he was going to start tracking daily rice prices when he went into the market and he came up with this theory of, you know, essentially open low, like what's the price when I get there at eight o'clock in the morning? What's the price when I leave at four o'clock? How high did it get? How low did it get? And we're 300 years later, give or take, he was actually born in 1724. And here we are. And I mean, obviously he knows cause he can look down you know, on the world, but the fact that his invention, and I'm sure he was just drawing it, maybe he was writing, writing them on paper, maybe he wrote them in the dirt, I don't know. But like that we use that now, I mean, their entire software systems, and it's gone even further, right? Like you can drill down to literally three second charts with the same principle. Yep. And it was just some guy who was like, you know what, I could visually chart this fascinating to me every time i think about it well and it's extremely valuable because it is a law supply and demand more supply than demand price drops more than demand than supply price rises regardless of what jerry says regardless of nvidia earnings it just is what it is we don't get to sit here and say oh that's not right well that can't be true because the market is moving lower after earnings or the, the stock is moving lower after earnings, we should pay attention. Or if you were to say, say, wow, rice prices were lower today than they were. And, you know, March was such a bad month for rice prices. And, oh, my gosh, here we are in September and rice prices are even lower. That means I got to be cheap, right? No, they're even worse than they were six months ago. I don't know. That doesn't make me think things are good. But I wouldn't know that. I wouldn't, you know, there's no way to be at the market in September and say, oh my, like, ah, yeah, what what were prices last week or three months ago? Like, I think they were kind of bad. I think it give you really, for me, just the spot you can pick where you want to be wrong or right. I know those are tough words to use in the market, but yeah, I mean, if, if we're below this, I don't need to own it. If we're above it, I really want to own it. I think it's fair to say that technical analysis shows us where we're wrong. And if we have to end up selling stocks, you know, we sold a little bit for clients this week. But if there's more, that's a decision that was made, I mean, at this point, probably a month ago. Right. Like, there is no me getting down to, oh my gosh, the market's about to close. What do I do? 
I mean, it's just we're below X or above X, and that it's a decision that was already made. Are you wrong, son? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, there's no such thing as batting a thousand. We've seen batting a thousand before with long term capital management, a bunch of Nobel Prize winners who wanted to lever up and do the Yen Carry trade in the late 90s. We saw how that resulted. As systems analysts, right, when we study systems, especially when you're involved with fat tail markets, the higher the rate of success, the greater the chance of some time in a 10 year period that you're going to have complete failure. So it's not about yeah, it's good. how often the trade is successful. It's about what happens when the trade is successful and what happens when the trade is not. Can you honor the stop loss? Can you keep the loss to a minimum of that particular position while maintaining reward of a position that's successful? It's a good way to put it. I like that. So here we are. We've got S&P 500. Ob- now, I mean, I, I shouldn't say obviously. I say obviously because we have today's data. But there's a price reaction here near the 5600s in the S&P. We have rising 200 days. Let me step back. Let's paint the picture of the intermediate term. Because we kind of talked about long term. We talked about interest rate cycles, 40-year cycles. We talked about an uninversion of the yield curve. We talked about 18-year cycles. We talked about the GAN cycle, the 10-year oil cycle. Those are long term. When we look intermediate term, we have mixed signals. We have... Price reaction at 56, near the 5,600. We have rising 200 day moving average. We just came off of a period, a nine month period that's in the top percentile of moves. So it can be both and in this environment. And it would be perfectly normal to move sideways in order to move higher. And if we're moving sideways, now what I want to pay attention to is which direction do we leave the sideways, the consolidation? So if we're going to move between 5,100 and 5,600, what happens out of that range. That's really what we have to be pay attention to as those involved with the market. It's really that simple. I'm not saying it feels comfortable. I'm not saying having a seven to 10% range is comfortable at all. I'm just saying that's what markets do. We get to see where the buyers and sellers are. You want to see buyers show up in something like the S&P 500, you know, above 5,100. They don't have to. 5,000 is also a logical level the lows that we saw in April. So we'll see. Time will tell. And sometimes that's uncomfortable. And what the beauty is, is if we use just simple rules, like a five day and a 200 day moving average that allows us to be whether we're in the market or not. And I know the support of this podcast used something like that. Good for them. Yeah. The adaptive select ETF, which is listed on the NYSE under ticker ADPV helps investors access two of the most prevalent factors in markets, momentum and relative strength. Using proprietary identification methods, the Adapt to Select ETF attempts to own the strongest 25 large cap stocks when the market is in an uptrend. And since not all market environments are the same, Adapt to Select seeks to prevent extended declines by moving to short-term treasury bills and cash during long-term market downtrends. Investors can find out more, including how to invest in ADPV by visiting ADPVETF.com or calling 1-833-880-5200. Investing involves risk, including possible loss of principal, distributed by Quasar Distributors, LLC. So we have tools that could tell us when we're an uptrend or a downtrend, and we have to be cognizant of time frame. Are we talking about uptrend or downtrend at the 15-minute level, or are we talking about it in the weeks to month time frame, or are we talking about days to weeks? Man, and doesn't that add to so much turmoil and confusion among participants? People who have opinions and disagreements about what's going to do this. And if they would just ask each other what time frame they're considering, probably most people would be on the same page about things. Yeah. Right. Because some investors time frames, if you know, some people day trade, I don't recommend it unless you're good at it. They're talking about intraday candles, intraday information. But if you're a retiree or you're close to retirement, you're more of a long term investor. You're more of a, you know, a person that's dealing with long term movements. And from that perspective, from a, a retiree's perspective or even a young person's perspective, we still have an uptrend on our hands. We still have higher highs and higher lows. We have rising 200-day moving average, at least domestically, U.S. speaking. Yes. 
but ranges are perfectly normal. They don't feel good, but they're perfectly normal. Been a lot of ranges throughout history. Yep. That's the price you pay. It is. Again, we'll go back to the data that the average drawdown per year is 10% and your average re- return in the S&P 500 at the end of the year is around 9, 8%. So think about that. You're, you're willing to lose nominally the same amount to gain above that. That's That feels uncomfortable. And we well, know hey. September and October are like this. I know we're only a couple years into this, maybe really not even a couple years. But in the grand scheme of things, it's also you get paid four and a half, five percent to sit in cash now. And that is something that in the grand scheme of these cycles, I mean, it's pretty new and it's not a bad trade off. You couldn't do that even four years ago. You had to get some type of return for your clients. You had to go out there and find something. And that was, I mean, you got to do better than risk-free rate. I guess a risk-free rate was basically zero. And that's just not the case anymore. Correct. The hurdle rate, as Warren Buffett would call it, you know, is that bond rate. And as we see that climb, you have to justify, and it's a beautiful two-edged sword, right? If the hurdle rate rises... You have to justify being in the stock market to get that return. And also, interestingly, it opens up more competition for companies that are issuing stock to participate in capital markets in that fashion, right? Because if you can no longer issue debt at 1% to 2% and you have to actually go to the capital markets to issue stock, we might see – because, you know, we're – we're at levels of stock issuance from public companies that are lower than we've seen in the last few decades. You'll probably see a resurgence. If we're in a rising rate environment, you would see a resurgence in companies that are issuing stocks. So more stocks to choose from. And that's not a bad thing either. It's markets, baby. I, I love it. I love the fact that you have this ebb and flow between credit market and capital market, and they intertwine based on this hurdle rate, based on the co- simply put the cost of money. Well, we've had a lot of buybacks, golly. That's been one thing they've whined about for the last however many years, buybacks. And yeah, so do you see a reverse? I mean, kind of on the back of what you just said, do you just see yeah, more more issuance, more IPOs? Right. They don't need to. And then you've got your venture capitalist firms, the companies that I don't think you see Facebook wait until 2013 to IPO anymore. I think you see them get kind of pushed out to the public a lot sooner than, you know, staying private for 10 years. And how long was Facebook around? What type of behemoth did it become before it actually became public? It was pretty big. Right. Correct. Well, that's why it'll be really interesting. The way you use this type of period of time, and what I mean by that is Let's say we're in a multi-month, just a couple months here of a sideways range. Technicians should be looking for the things that are strong. And let's say we have an even bigger correction. Let's say we do go back to 4,800 or something more than that. You could see the next reverse. Let's say we get a bear market. Let's say we get some correction. I'm just speaking hypothetically. Some big correction that's 20 to 50%. You need to pay attention to the things that come out of that, right? We've had the artificial intelligence hype. Could you see, similar to tech, right, the money got pulled forward for all the IPOs that happened in the late 90s. The capital markets pulled all that money forward. You had that correction in tech that was pretty significant going into 2003. But from that point forward, tech led. Does that same scenario unfold before us? I think we have to be open to that, that it's not the end of AI. To Ian's point, you could just see if we have a correction, you could see coming out of that an increase in IPOs for AI companies. So this market environment is about being open-minded and not too often I hear people say too far, too fast, or it has to go down, or my favorite political person, if they don't get elected, it's going to crash, or the Fed is doing this, the Fed is doing that, earnings are doing this, you know, it goes back to how many times do we see something like GDP get revised? Like, for example, this recession thing, we uninvert, we uninvert, let's say we do get a recession, 
We won't know that data until they revise it later. But the market's going to let us know where to be positioned and where not to be positioned. And that's where I, I can't imagine a process of managing money that doesn't involve studying supply and demand. It doesn't make sense to me. Everything 100%. else is sticking your thumb in the air. And I can say that because I've tried it. I've tried doing the, like, we'll read headlines, kind of try and get a gist on what the economy and the market should do. I tried that. I just sit in, I mean, I just sit in front of clients and talk about, or, you know, we own this because it's got a historically low PE ratio. And we think over the next seven to eight years, the market will realize its undervalued potential. I only have seven, eight years. My clients, right. not all really clients have seven, eight years. I and mean, I've tried just, what it really is, is guessing with really no, I mean, if your buy-in signal is, well, I think the economy is doing well, I'm going to buy stocks, right? So what's like, what's your out? I think the economy is doing poorly. Well, so what you got out in October, 2008? I don't like, I don't, I don't, where is that? So, I mean, with a price chart, I can just draw a line and I know like this is where I'm, I don't care the reason why I don't care what's going on in the world. I don't care about headlines. I just know if we're below this, I don't want to own stocks. And if that's not your, I just don't get how you get out. How do you determine when sellers have control? And then by the time it is, you're so mentally just in a blur. Imagine October, November, 2008. You're like, oh man, things have gotten really bad. I need to get out now. Yeah, you got a couple more, but like you're so... I mean, you've already lost 30%. What's that done to you? Right. I, I, I just don't. And then what's your psychological behavior when it's yeah. the basement in late 08, early 09, when there's blood in the streets? And, and I don't mean that literally. I mean that figuratively. There was just people forget that late 08, 08 early 09, people were literally talking about the end of the U.S. financial system. Yeah, I mean, your house, your house lost 50% of its value. There's a decent chance one of you or your spouse lost a job. Your 401k was cut in half. What's going to allow you to get back in? Yeah, you're already penny pension on groceries. There's a decent chance you probably ran up some credit card debt for a little bit. And so now why would, why would you, you why want would to pour you money into the S&P? Right. Yeah, you want to pour money into S&P? You got to be joking me. Right. Maybe, maybe when I get back to my high water mark from 07, right. well, I'm not putting any more money in this thing. Look what just happened. Yep. No good stock market. And that's why technical analysis is powerful because it allows you to get out when it doesn't make sense and allows you to get in when it doesn't make sense. Because it's not about the market doesn't care what I think. I don't know why it doesn't call me. I don't know why it doesn't return my phone calls. We would be at S and P eighty nine thousand if it cared what I thought, right? But we're not. Nope, we're not heading towards the end of our time, Ian. To paint this picture again for our listeners, we have rising two hundred day moving averages. We just came off an, a nine month period that's in the top quintile, if not percentile. September and October are notoriously volatile, seasonality speaking. We could be building a sideways range which would be perfectly normal to up the auction process to prove that the buyers from before are real. And if that doesn't happen, if we get a sideways range that doesn't hold, we'll know, we'll have information. Our clients are already aware that we've taken our foot off the gas, we've reduced exposure, and we will do that again if we break certain levels, we will adjust. And that's the power, that's the power to adapt. Adaptability is one of the most powerful abilities you can have an open mind and able to change your mind based on the new data that comes in where Bayesian statistic, the new information that comes in is the one we want to pay attention to in the context of all the information that's available. And so here we have what appears to be a price reaction in the S&P below 5,600. And until we clear that level, we have a range upon us. And until we clear below certain price levels, we have a range upon us. It's not a change in trend until we have that information. 100% agree. So anything else you want to touch base on before we close this out? 
No, I want to, you know, be adamant. The long term trend is fine. We need to be thankful for what we were gifted November through July. And just realize like any nothing moves in a straight line. It would be very, very, very historically in line, very practical to have a healthy sideways consolidation for at least a couple months. Yep. For sure. And if we are above 5,600, maybe the consolidation's over. Or if we are below 5,100, maybe the consolidation's over. Yep. It's that simple. We don't need to overcomplicate. The market's complicated enough. We don't need to overcomplicate it even more. And so with that, if you've appreciated what you've heard here, if you like the information that you receive, we do ask you to share it. We do ask you to give us a high ranking. We do really appreciate that. Allows us to get feedback from you that you appreciate what we're putting out. So please share it. Please give, please give us a high ranking and enjoy opening NFL football weekend. Yes, you do the same. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Ian, for being on here again. Uh, we'll do it again next week. All right. Have a great weekend, everyone.